Hello, hello, GM, GM. Welcome, welcome. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes here. So feel free to say hi. Let me know how everybody's doing in the comments. Excited to be here. Hello, hello. All right. So we're a couple minutes in already. How's everybody doing today? Happy Friday, everybody, on this Chainlink Hackathon day. Excited to be here. Excited. People are going to be learning about the audit process, which is incredibly important. So uh, we're, this is going to be a continuation of Andre's workshop yesterday. So if you haven't seen Andre's workshop, he gives a fantastic overview of all the different things that one needs to think about before going to audit and when it comes to security, right? He talks about re-entrancy, Oracle manipulation attacks. He talks about all these different methodologies when it comes to being secure in our smart contract development. So this is going to be a continuation of that. I think it's, um, I think it's two hours on the schedule. We're definitely not going to last two hours, which is good. <laughs> um, but let's uh, let's jump into this already. Oh, and I have nothing on my screen. One second, sorry. There we go. All right, so one of the first things I want to show you all, the Open Zeppelin Audit Readiness Guide. So you can even just Google it, Open Zeppelin Audit Readiness. Find it here. And what this is, is it's a list of things to keep in mind. It's a checklist to keep in mind before you go to audit, right? 
And it's even lets you, us know like, hey, what even when even should we go to audit? So it talks about uh, preparing for a smart contract audit, understanding when you're even going to audit. Um, and then it goes to the checklist, which you might think, oh, like, why do I need to deal with like the team and the community? Well, these can be, you know, some of the most important channels before you go to audit, right? If you, uh, if your team of developers hasn't written any tests, I would say you're definitely not ready for an audit. 100% not ready for an audit. So it's more than just your code uh, to go to an audit. Because if, if your tests don't pass, if you can't write tests, no one's, nobody, honestly, nobody should take your project seriously. Uh, because it's really, it's nearly impossible to make sure your code is secure unless you have really good tests. So talk about the team, uh, be able to connect with the auditors, use a free uh, software license. Uh, and then obviously the code uh, is an incredibly important part as well. So it's a great checklist for people looking to go to audit, uh, looking to launch their projects. And yeah, so and now... Yesterday, we talked a lot about some of the different tactics uh, people can use. Now, let's actually show some of those tactics. So the first thing I want to show you all is actually from the Hard Hat Starter Kit. And I'll put a link to it in the chat here, the Hard Hat Starter Kit. Hard Hat Starter Kit is in the chat. Uh, if you get clone this, you know, you'll, you'll get this in here. And what we want to do, and what we can do in here is there's two uh, more advanced testing pieces that we have that check for security. One of them uh, that's built into the hard hat starter kit, if you get clone it, is going to be fuzzings. So if we go to that test folder, go to contracts, test, fuzzing, we have what's called a fuzz test using the echidna tool. So let me... Um, in, uh, so Andre yesterday talked a lot about some of the different, um, where is this on GitHub? Talked a lot about some of those different static analysis tests that we can run. This is an example of a symbolic test that we, we, we want to run. Uh, trail, uh, Cry Tick is run by Trail of Bits. Uh, this Trail of Bits team is absolutely phenomenal. They make a ton of security open source tools. They also do audits. Um, I pretty much love everything they touch. Um, and this is part of the uh, Trail of Bits security toolbox. So that's a security toolbox, which I'm going to post in the chat as well. Which is a Docker container of some of their most prominent security packages. Echidna for fuzz testing, Ethano, an integration tool, Manticore, Symbolic Analyzer, Slither Static Analysis, Rattle EVM Lifter, and uh, this kind of example, not so smart contracts repository. So today I'm going to be showing you Echidna and Slither. Uh, Echidna is this fuzz tester, um, and it's, it's a great way to, to check for security. So uh, fuzz testing is the process of adding random data to your input to um, to try to find uh, to try to break it. So, for example, in our in our hardhead starter kit, we have this keepers uh, encounters echidna test, and yes, this test is actually written in Solidity. And what it does is uh, we have this function called echidna test perform upkeep gate, where we're saying, hey, no matter what input we give to our keepers contract we should always start off, counter should always be zero. Counter should always be zero. And if we go to the readme, we can actually see how to run this. Oops. Run yarn fuzzing in our terminal. Yarn fuzzing. And what... Oops. Oh, sorry. One sec, let me open up Docker. Uh, you do need Docker installed. Um, and we got a question. Do any of these port to Brownie? Yes, they absolutely do. Just 
start up Docker. I'll show you how this fuzz testing of the stuff works. Okay. Let me switch back now. I have Docker running now. But what Yarn Fuzzing does, if we go to the package of JSON, is it runs this Docker command, spin up the trail of, uh, of bits at security toolbox. So we pull down their, their Docker image, and inside this trail of bits at security toolbox Docker image, we have all this, uh, all these tools that we can work with. So we just run Yarn Fuzzing. Ah, Yarn Fuzzing. And now we have all of these resources just already inside of our uh, our, our new uh, ETH security box shell, right? So we get dropped into a new shell here, which is great. And we can do sulk select, use 0 0.8.7, choose the solidity, oops, uh, sulk select. Smoke. Select. Or with use. So select. Which one is it? I need to install first, sorry. Oak select, install, 0 0.8.7. Am I not installing right? What am, what am I doing wrong? Sulk select, use 0 0.8.7. Just did right. So it's like, anyone see what I'm doing wrong? I'm uh, I'm clearly typing something wrong with my silk select. Oh well. All right. Sorry about that. I'm I'm doing something wrong with my silk select, but it's fine. I don't. We don't really need to switch versions because we can see silk dash dash version anyways. We can see we're using zero point eight point eight, which is fine. So we're inside of this Docker shell, and Pete has a question: Can be ran without Docker, but installing? Oh yes. Uh, it, it can be ran without uh, Docker, uh, but I agree. <laughs> it's much easier uh, to use with Docker, actually. So once we're inside this Docker shell, uh, we can actually run our Echidna command now. So we have a, our Echidna test already installed in this shell here. And then we tell it which file we want, to, which file has the our Echidna test on it. We tell it which contract um, uh, inside of that file. Oops. And then we give it the config, right? And our config in config.yaml just gives it a whole bunch of flags to check out. One of them is remappings. Hardhat knows that at chainlink points to node modules, but Echidna has no idea, right? So we need to tell Echidna, hey, anytime you see at chainlink slash contracts, you're pointing to this node modules folder that we created, right? And it gives it some other, um, some other flags as well, but we can just run it by copying this command and running it, and we'll run this fuzz testing in here. So it's running a kid in a test perform upkeep, and it'll run it, how many times are we upset? 10,000 times. So it's going to just add 
random data to this echidna test perform upkeep 10,000 times. And if it finds a scenario where it can make, where it can make counter equal not zero, it'll flag it. It'll say, hey, we found an area where counter is zero. Uh, obviously, this is going to um, pass, though, um, because in our keepers right now, there's there's absolutely no way for counter to be anything other than zero when it's initialized. So, uh, and this may take a while. And this is where, uh, so Andre was talking about how symbolic execution can take a little bit longer. This is an example of, of symbolic execution. We are actually testing running, you know, that, um, that contract 10,000 times, which is insane. But uh, it has caught many, many bugs in the past. So, so that's one of the first tools that we can look at. We can write some fuzz tests um, to make our code look for more random data. Um, and this is kind of an example of how to do that. Um, I have another repo where um, we have this vault fuzz test. This one's going to be a better example where fuzzing will actually catch it. We have this contract vault, vault.sol, and we're saying, ah, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're a new Solidity dev, and we think, okay, you know, we'll just put the, you know, the private key on chain and uh you know we'll just nobody nobody will know to look at our storage locations and uh we'll just have a password and then if somebody sends us the or we'll have an unlock function and if someone sends us the password then great uh we'll unlock this contract we'll say s locked equals false and we'll say hey this is pretty good um but a fuzz tester could catch this almost instantly a fuzz tester could catch this really easily and then let me send you this this is also a sneak peek um print security this is a sneak peek into one of my free code camp modules one of my free code camp videos that i'm editing right now so here's a, a repo on uh, on some on what i'm going to be showing you here oops um but same thing we have this uh, this vault fuzz test, and basically what it's going to be doing is it's going to be trying different passwords. It's going to be trying different functions to make s locked equal true, and you can see how quickly it can actually find out our password is you know one two three asd uh, one two three. So in our constructor, we just create a new vault, um, and then we go ahead we run this test find password. So if we jump into our toolbox. Same thing here, and then let's go to go run the echidna test in here. Let's see, it'll almost instantly catch. Hey, you have an insecure. Boom! It already found it. Echidna test password failed. We found the password almost immediately. We found exactly the command to unlock this vault, uh, and this is an example of okay, well. Great. It's fantastic. We caught this because otherwise we, you know, might have thought our contract was secure. So fuzz testing can be me, fuzz testing can be incredibly, incredibly powerful. And use it as such. Okay, great. What's next? Okay, well, let's go back to the hard hat starter kit. Let's exit our Docker shell. What's next? What's the next thing that we can do? Well, one of the other most popular tools in the space is going to be this Slither, this Slither tool. So where is Slither? Slither. This also comes in the Trailer Bits toolbox. I have it installed locally, so I'm just going to go ahead and work with it locally. Um, but this is what's uh, called the static. Uh, this is called static analysis. Okay. So what this does is it just runs through your code and looks for common vulnerabilities. That's really it. Really, really minimalistic, really trivial, but it can save you a ton of headache down the line. Uh, so we can actually work with, oops. So let's say we're in our, um, let's say we're in our, our hard head starter kit. We can actually work with the Slither tool. I've already, like I said, I have it installed already. So I'm gonna do slither dash dash version. Great, I have it installed. We can say slither dot slash contracts. Uh, we're gonna say, hey, just run on, run on everything in our contracts folder, and we're gonna give it uh, same thing. We're gonna have to give it self remaps. 
maps, we're going to have to say anytime you see at open Zeppelin, that's going to be node modules. Slash at open Zeppelin. Um, at open Zeppelin. Anytime you see at chain link, that's going to be equal to node modules. Chain link. And that's it, right? This is all we have to do. And so this is going to run on all of our hard hat projects or brownie projects or foundry products. doesn't matter. They all work um, across the across the way. So now we get this big, horrible monstrosity of an output like this, right? And we can go through it. And it just gives us a, a good idea of what's going on in our contracts, right? So it even compiles first. So it, it's giving us some stuff. Hey, we have some un used function parameters like in fulfill random words in a random number consumer we're not using the request id in the hard hat starter kit now the reason we have it in there is just to show people you know what that actually looks like but you as a developer you might go oh i might want to comment this out i might want to update this to make it a little bit better so it just gives you all the warnings and then it gives you all this green yellow and red text so the green text is saying hey we found something it's probably fine but you might want to check it out. Yellow text is we found something. It's probably not fine, but you might want to check it out. And then red text is like, we found something. It's definitely bad. Found something that's definitely bad. So we have yet uh, red, uh, green and yellow in here. So we're probably okay, but it's good to still check them out. So if we go through this line by line, we can, we can get some tips on how to make our code even better. So for example, random number consumer v2.constructor shadows uh vrf consumer base v2 dot vrf coordinator so in our random number consumer v2 we have this vrf coordinator variable um that is also inside that is also inside vrf consumer base v2 so we have this vrf coordinator um variable in two places which isn't good which can be really confusing for developers uh working with this so that's something that we probably would want to change and get rid of we wouldn't want this to be vrf coordinator in these two places again the reason we have it as the same is just to make it easier for people to understand what's going on okay and then it even gives us a little link of exactly what it's looking for so it's saying shading local here's kind of a minimalistic description or excuse me, shadowing local. Here's a minimalistic uh, description of it, of, uh, of kind of like what this would look like. So we have this global variable owner in here, and we also have a local variable owner in the parameter here. So we're defining owner twice. So our code is, it can be a little bit uh, uh, tricky for developers to know which one's which. <clears throat> it even has a little recommendation. Rename the local variables that shadow another component. Gives us different versions of Solidity used. So this is fine. We don't really care. Um, it's saying uh, fulfill random words is never used. We obviously know that it is used. We know that the Chainlink node is actually going to call back to this. Um, but so there's just checking, uh, just saying, hey, like, I don't see that it's used. We have a whole bunch of um, this allows old versions. So we have different versions of Solidity across you know some of the packages that we imported. Uh, we have some different some naming conventions that's that uh, Slither isn't familiar with. So Slither isn't familiar with like the S underscore naming convention. So it's just flagging that saying, hey, like I'm not familiar with that naming convention. Uh, this one I actually really like. Random consumer, uh, random number consumer V2 use literals with too many digits. So if we go to contracts, random number consumer V2 again on line 131 or excuse me, 31, we see this. Function s callback gas limit equals 100,000. The reason it's calling this out is because having, you know, a ton of zeros can be really hard to read, right? And so usually it might be better to do like one B. E, oh, wait, how many zeros did I have? One, two, three, four, five. One E5, because uh, this is a lot easier to read how many zeros it has. We're saying one and then five zeros. Versus this is kind of hard to read. And then if we have something like this, 
right? We might gloss over it and not recognize that it has the wrong number of zeros. Now we get to some yellow stuff. And this is in the uh, in the actual Chainlink code. Uh, Chainlink code's been audited though um, many times and is in, in use and is okay. Um, but it might be good to check out. So we're getting this uh, we're getting this an uninitialized local variable. So we're saying we're getting some local variables, but they're never actually initialized. We can go look at the um, slither slither docs here, and we say, for example. Um, this address two uh, is never actually initialized, right? In this minimalistic contract, two is never initialized. So we're transferring to nothing. So, and this yellow is saying, hey, uh, if you if you don't initialize that variable, people are gonna lose funds. Um, you know, luckily those variables have been initialized already. So it's okay. We have an initialized function as well. Uh, and it gets mad about, uh, it's it's just saying, hey, you have an unused return, which we also don't really care about. So all of these in this yellow block are saying, hey, you have an unused return, which, again, we don't really care about. And we keep going, and we can just keep going. We can keep seeing a whole bunch of this stuff. Now, the rest of those aren't don't actually end up catching any bugs. So let's look at an example of where one of them does actually catch a bug. So let me flip back to... To this uh, hard hat security FCC again, uh, you can check out the GitHub for that hard hat security FCC, and we'll run Slither on these contracts, and we'll see which ones that it catches. Actually, before we even run it, let's do a uh, let's do a quick. I'm gonna flash these on the screen for like barely any time. Um, let me know what what con what functions you think that Slither will catch. So we have this this code here, and do we think Slither is gonna catch anything in here? We have this. Actually, this is too big. I'm gonna tell you right now, Slither won't catch anything in here. What about this one? Do you think Slither will catch anything in this one? What do we think? Let me know in the comments. What do we think Slither will catch in this one? I'm gonna keep going. What about this one? The name of the uh, the name of the file pretty much tells what it is. <laughs> what do we think? All right, I'm seeing some people asking quite or some some people guessing. What do we think about this one? Will Slither catch everything? Will Slither catch everything in these? What do we think? And then while uh, uh, let me flip, let me show this one back again. Um, there's some questions in here. Sir, whether testing with Echidna is required, even after testing with Mocha and Chai, yes. You should absolutely run fuzz testing even after Mocha and Chai, uh, if you're looking to audit, yes. With fuzzing, it looks like I need to already know where to look. Isn't static security analysis more rewarding? When do I want fuzzing over static analysis? You want both, actually. You don't want one or the other, you want both. Um, so fuzzing is gonna be good for you not knowing what to look for. Um, so you're saying with fuzzing, I, it looks like I already know where to look. It's not the case. Like maybe you have some function and you're like, I'm pretty sure that this is secure. I'm pretty sure nobody can screw this up, but let me run a fuzz test that'll run through, you know, thousands of different scenarios that I never thought of, right? And maybe there's one scenario where um, it totally breaks your entire contract, but you just never thought of it. So fuzz testing is really, really important because it can catch those scenarios that you didn't think of. Won't Soul Hint catch these style aspects already? Oh, so for the style aspects, Soul Hint um, might. Yeah, but I mean, that's also just style stuff. All right, cool. We have a ton of guesses. I'm seeing all these guesses. All right, cool. And then Victor, will Slither find only most common pitfalls? You are correct. So they're... So there shouldn't be your like end all be all. It just finds common pitfalls. So let's go ahead and run Slither here. So we'll do Slither dot slash contracts. Actually, do I? I think I have it in the package that Jason up here. It's like yarn Slither. Yep. So I'm just going to run yarn Slither because it already runs all that 
all those like remappings and stuff. Yeah, and slither. We'll see what we get here. Okay, so right at the get go, it gives us this red output. Now, if you see red, you should be afraid. <laughs> if you see red in a slither output in your contracts in your code, you should go, "Oh, ooh, eek, I'm nervous." So we see in this metaphor metamorphic contract dot soul. Go here. We see it is never initialized. So we have this metamorphic contract and it is initializable, which means after we deploy it, it needs to be initialized. Um, but we have this function kill and it says, okay, whoever is the owner can self-destruct this contract. If we don't auto initialize this contract, somebody else could call the initializer function, take ownership of this contract and then kill it. This is actually something that has happened in the past where people have deployed their contracts, forgotten to initialize them, and then somebody else has taken ownership of it and destroyed it. So Slither would have saved you if you ran Slither uh, on this contract. So what else? It gives us a ton of greens. And then what's this? We've got another red here. Reentrancy and etherstore.withdraw. So if we go to reentrancy.sol, We've got a pretty classic reentrancy attack here in our withdraw function, right? We go ahead and we send ETH here, and then we update the state of the contract, which is not good, right? Because whoever we send ETH to, they could use the fallback function and destroy us. And Slither caught that. Classic reentrancy. Thank you, Slither, for keeping us safe, right? And obviously, the way to fix this would just be to go boop. Boop, and you're good to go. Anything else? Okay, that's it. So Slither and our fuzz tests fixed vault. Uh, fuzz testing caught vault. Slither caught reentrancy. And Slither caught metamorphic. So what about these two? What about these two? Well, bad RNG didn't get caught by Slither. But this is where we'd move into maybe a more formal audit process, right? Or we could use one of those cloud tools like MythX or, or try Mithril or try other tools. Um, but eventually, after you run through your suite of tools, the audit process, you move into manually, like literally combing through each line of your code looking for uh, things that break, right? So in this pick winner function, somebody could, and I've seen this actually happen. So please, anybody here, like, don't do this. Seen this happen way too many times. Um, where somebody goes, okay, I'm gonna get a random number by like, you know, doing the block difficulty, message dot sender, all this other stuff, and I'm gonna get a random number through that. People can not only influence this block dot difficulty, but people can spam this pick winner function, uh, rejecting transactions that don't give it the right seed. Um, there's a ton of ways to exploit this so that the random number. Uh, is a random number that they want. So this pick winner is no good. Obviously, the fix to this is just using Chainlink VRF. And then what's the final one? Liquidity pools Oracle. Um, this is one that Andre talked about yesterday. And this by itself isn't really that terrible of a contract. Um, it's, it's not great. Um, but the thing to be afraid of using is this get swap price. So we're using this liquidity pool, we're using this decentralized exchange as a way to get what the price of two assets are. Now, if somebody were to um, dump a ton of liquidity into here or do some crazy swaps, they could tank or, or shoot the price up. If you're using this get swap price in your protocol, um, you're going to have a manipulated price. And this, uh, like Andre was saying yesterday, is one of the most common vulnerabilities in the smart country space. Uh, I've seen hack after hack, someone saying, hey, I'm just going to use a um, use a DEX as our Oracle, and they get they get hacked. The DEX gets manipulated, somebody does some flash loan, somebody does some crazy thing, the DEX gets manipulated, and then the protocol is wrecked. So even though this is a decentralized exchange, it's a centralized point of pricing information. So a DEX is a decentralized exchange, but a centralized price oracle. Remember that. A DEX is a decentralized exchange, but a centralized price oracle. 
just with that information, you are now better than many, many <laughs> DeFi protocols that have been hacked. So, um, questions here. Yes, so there we'll find uh, common pitfalls. Yep, exactly. You got it. Owner not initialized. Correct. Yep. The bad RAM could be attacked with front running. It could also be attacked with front running. Could you give an example of how KeeperBot can save the pick winner? How KeeperBot can save the pick winner? Um, I don't. I don't think it would be a KeeperBot fixing this. It would be a Chainlink VRF fixing this, right? It would be getting a verifiably random number would be the fix. I don't think Keeper actually fixes this unless you know something that I don't know. But with that, that's pretty much the majority of what I wanted to go over here, um, which I know it said two hours on the uh, on the schedule. Apologies there. I uh, actually meant this to be a shorter one and we put it was a longer one. Uh, yeah, I just want to show you this, some of the tools, some of the things to think about. Now, something I want to note too, especially for this hackathon, right? For this hackathon, um, people, you might be like, oh, I want to make my contracts the most secure, the best, you know, which I love. I'm the same way, right? I want to make my contracts the best. For building MVPs, like, or, or mock, or excuse me, minimum viable projects or products. And for these hackathons, if they're not the most secure thing, we're, no, we're, nobody's going to dock points, okay? Um usually making things super super secure that's going to be you know what you want to do before launching before you know doing an audit etc for the hackathon don't worry too much about that right that should be the last step uh, before moving forward you don't really like when you're building you don't want to get caught up in uh trying to just make everything absolutely perfect because it'll just it'll slow you way down right so just build build your mvp come back later and then update everything to be more secure uh, so that you can launch, so that you can move forward. But uh, yeah, for this hackathon, don't worry about it too much. Um, but it, uh, it is just good to keep these in mind for later on, right? This is almost more of a, hey, once you finish the hackathon and you're looking to launch, um, these are the, some of the things that you need to keep in mind. So, um, and then on the topic of auditors, there's a lot of auditors in the space. Um, there's a lot of not so good auditors. <laughs> If an auditor comes back to you and, and they say that they can uh, audit your contract and get you a turnaround like in like a couple days, they're probably not a great auditor. I'm just being honest. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really hoping somebody does like an audit, uh, like an audit tourist tier list. Um, Cause right now it's really hard to like get reviews and stuff on auditors. But the cool thing is you can actually go through auditors, you know, public audits, see, you know, where your auditor has screwed up or, or been good and, and get a good idea of how good they are there. Could you please, Black Coat, uh, go back to metamorphic, no initialized warrant to explain again the vulnerability and how to install it? I absolutely can do that. So metamorphic contract .so. so we're using this initializable proxy. So we're saying metamorphic contract is initializable. And in this initializable code that we're importing, we have modifier initializer. Um, we have mono, uh, what does this do? We're saying this is a, an initializable contract meaning that uh, there should be some function uh, that's an initializer function that gets called right when this is deployed, right? But we never do that. This never actually gets initialized. So this owner never actually gets created. This owner, this owner never actually gets assigned when we um, deploy this contract, right? So what we want to do to fix this is going to be constructor. And we could just have it, you know, this be our... Um, we could have our constructor, quote unquote, be our initializer. We could say owner equals message dot sender. Right. We just want to assign that owner somewhere. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, address. We just need to assign that owner somewhere. That's it. 
That's all we need to do. And this could be in an initializable function. Um, that's where this initializer comes in. I'm not going to go over that. But basically, we just need to set owner up somewhere. That's it. Okay, I'm, I'm confused in that. Uh, thanks. Wait, uh, let me know. Uh, oh, what were we confused on? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yep. Could you talk about how auditing works with Open Zeppelin? Yeah, sure. So you can check out their auditing system here. And this is literally their timeline. You contact them, they give you a quote, start the audit, give you a report, you fix stuff, and then they publish it. Uh, and here's some of their most popular audit reports, which are awesome. Um, but I mean, that's pretty much it. Uh, you can check them out here. Not affiliated with them or anything. It just opens up when it's awesome. Um, if y'all start using it opens up on audits, we should ask for kickbacks, huh? <laughs> just kidding. Um, JavaScript or Python for Web3? Uh, whatever you want. Honestly, whatever you want to do, whatever your heart desires, doesn't matter. I prefer Python, um, but that's me. However, at the same time, if I'm looking to build a full stack application, I know I have to use JavaScript. So whatever your heart desires. How does one start their career as an auditor? Step one, you become a fantastic smart contract engineer. Uh, step two, you start becoming a more security focused smart contract engineer. And step three, you start doing audits or you apply for auditing companies. Oops. How much roughly can an auditor charge? Uh, it really depends. I've seen ranges from uh, like 10,000 to $70,000 for an audit. Um, but it's also, uh, they usually charge per line of code. So like the more code you have, the more that they'll charge. Um, and then they spend days pouring over it. Um, now for a lot of people here thinking about getting into the audit auditing business, um, I, I need to give you, I don't know, my, my words of wisdom isn't the right word, but my words of ethics. There are currently a lot of not good auditors out there. When somebody is getting an audit from an auditor, they're saying, hey, we're we're trusting that, and this, and this is why trust sucks, right? <laughs> uh, we're trusting that we're going to pay you a ton of money, and you're going to make sure we aren't shooting ourselves in the foot. And right now, and this is really disappointing to me, there are a lot of auditors in the space that will give you a turnaround time of a couple days, like maybe even a week, and they just do a terrible job. And people have been launching contracts thinking they're secure, thinking that they're good. Um, obviously, they didn't do their own due diligence, right? They should have done more due diligence themselves. But um, uh, these auditors are just saying, okay, cool, you're going to pay us, you know, 30 grand. Cool. Um, here's your audit, you pass, ship it. And just no, no care, like at all. Uh, and it's a travesty. And it's low key a pandemic. <laughs> Uh, or an epidemic that's going on around right now. So if you want to be an auditor, uh, be an amazing auditor. That's really what I'm trying to say, uh, because we do need auditors in this space. Auditing is a is a really important, really needed service. Um, so if you're going to do it, be really freaking good. That's that's just what I want to say. Uh, be a really good auditor, because we have there are plenty of bad auditors in the space right now. Open Zeppelin is one of the ones that's phenomenal, right? Open Zeppelin's phenomenal auditor, Trail of Bits, Sigma Prime. Uh, there's a lot of auditors that do a really, really good job. You can use either one. Yep. If you want to use Python, you can learn Brownie. If you want to use JavaScript, learn Hardhat. Yes, exactly. How check ins work on Tuesday? Oh, good question. So on Tuesday, um, there will be a channel in the Discord, and you just post your project, your Git repo, and your idea. That's it. You don't even have to have any code. Just put a Git repo with your idea, and we'll send an email to let you know uh, any other information. These have been great questions. Great, great questions. Any other questions here? So yeah, um, if you want to be an auditor, please continue down that path. But if you are going to be a bad auditor because you think it's a good way to make a quick buck, um, you are... Yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. And people will quickly, uh, people will quickly suss you out. Let's 
So if you're going to be an auditor, be the best auditor. Any other questions here? Will there be any office hours? Uh, so these are kind of the office hours. Uh, so jumping on Discord, asking questions, connecting with the community, that those are going to be the best kind of office hours. Uh, we've done office hours in the past, and they're never a good use of time. So we just we stopped doing them. Could you make auditing smart contract or tool? Yes, you could. In fact, please build that. Yes. That will be awesome. Any other questions here? Which one is better to do? Uh, I mean, uh, better is kind of a interesting word there. It's what uh, whatever you want to do. It doesn't. Uh, I don't. I don't think better. Uh, I don't think there is one that's better. It's whatever you want to do. A few questions. Any other questions here? These have been great. Hopefully, you all are more security conscientious and know uh, some security tools now and how to use them. Any other questions? What do you think would increase adoption of Python? Um, good question. More big projects using Python. Um, More big projects using Python. I mean, more tooling around Python. Um, I just saw the other day that the, the, uh, there's some there's like a new Python script tag for the front end, which is really cool. I mean, if Python worked in the front end, that would also be that would also be game over um, in like a good way. Just because the reason JavaScript is so widely used is because it's you know one of the only languages that work. Excuse me, in the front end. So. More use cases, more tools, that type of thing. More people using them. What would you say are the top five audit companies? Um, good question. I mean, those three I named were really good. Uh, I don't know if I... I don't really want to... Um, I also don't really want to like endorse any. Like, I guess I kind of already did. Um, I would say those three I gave, Sigma Prime... Open Zeppelin, Trail of Bits are some of my favorite. I don't know. I, I I would have to get back to you on like a real like, okay, these are my, you know, stamp of Patrick stamp of approval. Uh, I would have to get back to you on that. I would have to do more research. Good question. All right, cool. Well, if there's no more questions here, thank you all so much for being here. Um, this today, oh, and before anybody leaves, before anybody leaves, please scan this QR code. Let us know what you thought about this session, uh, if you liked it, if you hated it. And today is Friday. And if you go to uh, chain.link slash hackathon, you'll notice workshops start slowing down after today. So we have one at 9.30, why you should use BAS, uh, BCAC, BSC application sidechain. We have two on Monday. We have some on Tuesday. And then after that, it's just building. So we only have a few more workshops left. Uh, this is today. This is actually the last kind of like Chainlink Labs run workshop. So it's the last workshop from the Chainlink Labs team. So we've given you all the information that you need to be successful. We've given you all these workshops. Um, hopefully these all have been helpful and hopefully you all can take all the knowledge that you've learned in these, go make something absolutely amazing. So, uh, with that being said, thank you all for being here. Good luck at the hackathon and we'll see you all soon.